I can see this at the Grammys next year. <laughs> oh, did I, I send to you the web page, no? Yes. Okay. That's I not the Grammys. Yes, well, we're working on it. <laughs> okay, so. Um, who's my name, Steve? Um, Christian Davenport. This is for uh, a project that we refer to as uh, Minefields. Um, I'm pulling up my listing of questions, which are going to help kind of guide part of the conversation. Okay. Well, thank you very much for agreeing to um, to uh, be interviewed. And um, six relatively straightforward questions. I might allow for a follow-up or two, if you don't mind. <laughs> um, what research of yours are you most proud of? So that's a hard question. Um, so I, I would say there are a few things. I, I'm, I view the war trap in hindsight as a terrible book, an embarrassingly bad book. But um, I, I think it was, despite being a terrible book, a very an important book, and I'm very proud that I had the notion to try to frame the problems of international conflict as problems of rational choice, uh, and learned a lot in writing that book about how to think better about the problem. So I'm very, I'm, I'm very proud of that book. Um, I'm uh, very proud of the selector theory, which uh, I think is the first thing approaching a general theory of politics that we have, so, and it's still growing and building, so I'm, I'm very excited by that. Um, and you said specifically research, because, yeah. uh, I mean, you can expand the question if you want. Yeah, I mean, the first thing that, that uh, I think about with some pride in my career is my graduate students and some of my undergraduates. Oh, wow. uh, I've supervised somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 PhD dissertations or served on committees, and I, I, I've had the good fortune of having some incredibly wonderful uh, and accomplished students in lots of different domains. Uh, Jim Morrow, Al Stam, Jim Firon, Alistair Smith, Ken Schultz, Wu uh, Sung Kim in Korea, who not only has published in the top American journals, but is a uh, politically very influential figure in the South Korean government who has brought in theoretic reasoning to foreign policy making. That's very exciting. Uh, and, and others. I mean, it's, it's, I'll, make sure, I'll make sure I list them on the web page. Uh, it's, it's a long list. Uh, Adam Merowitz uh, was an undergraduate student of mine uh, at Rochester, uh, and he says he was thinking about being a lawyer, what a mistake. <laughs> uh, so he, he took a, a graduate seminar with me at Rochester as an undergraduate. By the way, Alistair Smith, Fiona McGillivray were in that same class. It was, it was quite a class. Uh, and that class persuaded him that he should do political science because he thought, my God, if this guy could have a job as stupid as he is, I could do great in this field. And you know, so I, I'm, I'm very proud that uh, I, 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 I had that opportunity and that effect on people. That is great. Yeah, we've not had the, um, anyone actually move past that to actually see the kind of generational dynamic of what it is that we do. I think that's great. Um, what led you to undertake the research um, project for which you are most widely known? Well, you tell me what I'm most widely known for. Um, I mean, the two you mentioned would probably be kind of uh, fitting in there, but I'd also suggest uh, that you could define it as you see fit. I think that's fine. Okay. Um, well, let, let's 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 start with uh, the war trap. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, I was thinking about this recently because of something that somebody said to me which sent me back to read uh, my dissertation, a very boring first book. But I was struck by several things uh, that I didn't remember. But there they are in print. Uh, somewhere around page three of, uh, of the book that was my dissertation, um, I say that uh, Politics is about winning coalitions and losing coalitions. And the difference between winning coalitions and losing coalitions is the ability to provide private goods. And then I expand from there. And as I was reading, I said, like, that's, 
that's right kind of, there's the selector theory beginning to have its foundations. And then when you go to the concluding chapter of my dissertation, it talks about what I thought of at the time. So this book was published in 75, my PhD is 71. Um, thought about what, what, what constitutes political development. And uh, what it says is, uh, it's not the things that people think of, uh, economic growth, democracy, it is politicians maximizing the probability of getting what they want. Mm. Uh, by selective theory, what they want is to keep their jobs. And it's like, it took me an awfully long time to work out what was there in my dissertation that I, uh, I mean, at some level I must have seen, but didn't really understand. Mm. The, the war trap uh, grew out of a series of readings and then papers that I wrote. Uh, so, you know, I, I didn't do IR as a field in graduate school. Oh. Um, I was a South Asianist. My dissertation was on India. Oh, that I remember nicely. Yeah, yeah. I, I, the first two books are on India, and uh, every now and then I, I trot out. I, you know, I, I, I speak, read, and write Urdu, not well, oh, but uh, yeah, okay. you know, all that. I was a real area specialist. I did field work and you know, all that. Um, so I didn't really do IR. I got hired as an IR person, and I was desperate for a job, so I, I took it. Nobody, and what was your first job? Uh, Michigan State. Uh, nobody wanted an Indianist uh, back in the early 70s. The, the I, I, I wonder if we still do, but yeah. So well, yeah. there is that. Yeah. Uh, anyway. So, you know, I kind of brushed off. I, I, I read, uh, there was a series of articles uh, in 63, 64. Kenneth Waltz had laid out a, a, the early version of his ideas of bipolarity. Uh, and Deutsch and Singer had a paper uh, also about bipolarity, and so did Richard Rosecrans. Uh, and I realized in reading those that, at least as I understood it, the argument was misguided. Uh, that what Waltz was essentially arguing is that bipolar systems are more stable than multipolar systems because multipolar systems contain a lot of uncertainty and bipolar systems don't. And under uncertainty, people misjudge, miscalculate, uh, misperceive, and that leads them into uh, errors and, and therefore into war. And uh, Deutsch and Singer said bipolar systems have much less uncertainty than multipolar systems. And in a multipolar environment, people are very cautious because they don't know what the consequences are of what they're doing, and so forth. And I looked at this and I said, well, so it's nothing to do with polarity. Polarity is just an, uh, a proxy for responses to uncertainty. Yeah. And then I thought, well, if that's right, states, so, so, so that implies that there are several possibilities here. Essentially, what Waltz is assuming is that uh, in the face of uncertainty, people are risk takers. And essentially, what Deutsch and Singer were assuming was that in the face of uncertainty, people are risk averse. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, so we can't really talk about states as unitary actors because different people have different risk propensities. And if we allow that there is a distribution of risk propensities, then we should see that bipolarity is irrelevant mm. uh, because we, we could get any result. My first IR, well, it's not really my first IR paper, it's the first IR paper I did by myself, uh, Measuring Systemic Polarity, uh, which I actually wrote as a graduate student paper one IR course I took. Um, Evidently did well. Yeah. It wasn't published until much, much later, but that provided a mechanism to estimate uh, how polarized things were and so forth. And I then did a series of papers. Uh, Do you remember how you measured polarity? Oh, I, know, I remember exactly uh, how. Uh, the, the, that measure still, uh, well, has been, been modified in clever ways uh, by Signorino and Ritter. It's still pretty widely used. Um, so. I took every pair of states and I put each pair into a 4 by 4 table as follows. Uh, so each state could have any one of four relations with other states. They could have a defense pact, a non-aggression pact, an entente, or nothing. And I argue that there was an ordinal hierarchy there in terms of the expressed commitment. I didn't have this vocabulary then, but it could be, could be cheap talk. Yeah. 
but since it was public, it was probably not cheap talk. And what I did is I, I put all other states for each pair in that 4x4 four four tape. And I asked, how closely correlated are the alliance portfolios of state A and state B? Uh, and then I used uh, Kendall's Tau B to measure that. And the, the idea, and I, so I measured three things. Um, I, 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 I actually was doing network analysis at the time. I used something called Johnson Hierarchical Clustering, which I think nobody would use anymore. I, I was going to plead ignorance on that one. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not, it, it was big in its day, especially in, in the network field, but uh, you know, it's been surpassed. Um, and I used that to cluster these, these scores into each of state's blocks. And uh, in each block, I measured two characteristics of the block. Uh, I called them tightness and discreteness. Uh, tightness was how close the similarity of the bonds were among the members of the block. And discreteness was a measure of how permeable the block is. How much s linkage is there outside the block with gotcha. people not in the block? Um, and so then in, in uh, 19, so measuring system of clarity was published in 75. In 78, uh, I did a paper that applied these measures to various dependent variables having to do with uh, the onset and uh, duration of war and concluded that the evidence was that these changes in tightness had an effect. Nothing else did. I sort of think this, this systemic stuff is wrong. The logic isn't there. So then I followed up with a paper, it's a simulation paper. So let's assume different distributions of risk taking among leaders. And let's see what happens when we just have them intersect with each other. Uh, how does that tip the probability? And then the unitary, unitary actor is kind of assumption? Yeah, it's got to go away. Okay. Um, so uh, this is a long-winded answer. So that took me to doing the, the war trap. I, I, I had a Guggenheim fellowship at the time, so I had a year off to do it. Um, and although the, uh, the war trap still deals with the state, as the actor, it has a section uh, that addresses how one might do that, uh, which was to say, so the, the leader is a gatekeeper, and uh, there is a median voter in the state, um, and the leader works out what the central tendency of the uh, population is in terms of their preferences, uh, and then that affects action. So unlike uh, the realism, neorealism, uh, neoliberalism work that precedes this, um, preferences mattered. And preferences varied. It wasn't everybody has the same preferences as they do in your realism. There's elements that are kind of like, um, that seem to kind of resonate with some of the stuff that's found in American politics. Do you think yeah, you, absolutely. Were, you were clearly kind of influenced by that? Um, um, so I, I was, yes, and I was influenced by increasingly, uh, already by then, with the idea, remember I was a comparativist, with the idea that international relations is no different from any other politics and this idea of the state that didn't make sense. You know, people make choices, states don't. I, w I was hugely, uh, hugely influenced by William Riker. So to backtrack a little bit, uh, my first semester in graduate school, I come from Queens College, uh, a very anti-quantitative department. I didn't even know mathematics until the science existed. I had no inkling that there was quantitative work. I went to Michigan because I had a strong India program. Uh, nothing to do with what we think of as Michigan. Um, anyway, uh, I get there and uh, one of my courses is with Donald Stokes, uh, one of the co-authors of The American Voter. And uh, Stokes required each student in the class to make a class presentation on a reading. It's a long list of stuff that was all heavily statistical, and there was a book by William Wright, The Theory of Political Coalitions. Now, I appreciate you how little I knew, but as an undergraduate, I had read Riker's book on federalism. There's no math, there's no statistics. It's a historical analysis of the origins of federalism. So I shut my hand up when I saw the name Riker because here was something I thought I could do. You know, I understand about this stuff. So uh, 
I'm reading the theory of political coalitions, and you know, very quickly I realized, whoops, I, I made a big mistake here. <laughs> this is not what I was expecting. Um, in any event, I read it very, very, very carefully. And uh, Riker uh, purports to prove three theorems in uh, the theory of political coalitions. One that's very famous, the size principle. One that was moderately influential in IR for a while, the disequilibrium principle, and a middle one, which is called the strategic principle. And if I remember correctly, page 131. You can't kill me with this, okay? I'll look it up later too. There was a math error. Okay. He had inadvertently reversed an inequality sign, yeah, yeah. and so the strategic principle the theorem was false. So. I was, I, I can't describe how excited, how transforming a moment this was for me. Stokes would meet with each student before they made their class presentation to find out what they were going to do, try to hone it. So I went to him, I said, well, I'm going to talk about the strategic principle being false. He said, what do you mean false? I said, well, the, the math is wrong. So he, he said, I, I show him, he says, it's probably a typo. I said, no, no, follow the logic, turn the page, you see he's deriving stuff from this, it's wrong. He's got the, the inequality going the other way. Turns out that, that he sees that that's true. So to me, it, it was this moment where for the first time I, I had a realization that you could talk about something important in politics, not express an opinion. You could say, this is not true. And I, I didn't know that was possible about politics. So that was was transformative for me. Anyway, uh, there was a lot of serendipity. So uh, Stokes said, well, have you read Riker's uh, new proof of the size principle? So he postponed my last presentation. I went off to the library. I read the new proof. I came back to Stokes you know, several days later. Yeah, this is really interesting. But it doesn't have anything to do with the strategic principle. He said, have you read von Neumann and Morgenstern? This is an incredibly hard book. Um, it's still, I mean, the math is really archaic. But I went to the library and got it. It's a very thick, boring book, hard book. I had no help. I read it on my own. I read it very slowly. So you know, several weeks went by. Met with Stokes again. And talked about it. And I, so then he was ready to let me do the presentation. And I said, I'm going to write to William Riker. He said, Don't, don't do that. <laughs> And we chatted about it, and it, he revealed that he had a job offer at Rochester. And, and here was some upstart first semester graduate student going to write to Bill Riker, Dear Professor Riker, this is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, uh, Don became extremely supportive. He did something for me. I, 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 don't, I don't know that I would be capable of doing this for one of my students. So I, I wanted to, that summer, I had a, an NSF traineeship. I wanted to run an experiment testing the new derivation of, of the strategic principle. And so I went to the department chair, because it was supposed to be $500 in, in the NSF budget for me uh, to do work over the summer, which, you know, back in, this is the late 60s, it was a lot of money. So I went to Sam Ellersville, who was department chair, so you know, no student ever asked for that money, we spend it. So I went back to Stokes. I said, thank you for agreeing to supervise this. I won't be able to do it. Money's not there. He said, how much money do you actually need? This is in the summer of 1968. So I think I need $300. He took out his personal check. Personal check. Not a grant. And wrote me a check. He said, do the work. In today's dollars, that's maybe $4,000. It was. Anyway, so I get to the war trap. I, I, well, of course, I, I, I'm at Rochester by now. I'm, I'm a colleague of Bill Riker. Um, my job at there was also a very, very interesting experience. Um, and I'm sort of putting all of this stuff together in my head. And fortuitously, I was said I became this very interested in coalitions. My dissertation was about coalitions in Indian state level governments, a topic most students should ever write a dissertation. <laughs> Who cares about state level coalitions in India? But anyway, um, so. All this is sort of coming together, and I thought, well, if I treat the median voter as kind of a preference of the state leader, I can, I can 
do this. And I, so I, I devised this model. Uh, and then that eventually morphed into, um, several years later, into War and Reason, where then there was an extensive form really game and a domestic component to the model. So I, was I, I, I can't just assume the gatekeeper got to have the, the domestic populace has to be doing something in here. And uh, then that eventually morphed into uh, selector theory, which is hinted at in the last chapter of War and Reason, where it's all about domestic interests and taking into account the domestic interests of your adversary <laughs> and your adversary taking into account your domestic constraints and how that shapes choices. It's just a very different way of thinking about the problem uh, of conflict. And it, for me, solidified the idea because I, I could, uh, with my colleagues, I could derive results in the selective framework about international conflict. And I could derive results about immigration and emigration, I could derive results about education policy, I could derive about health policy, and also this is about how leaders who want to keep their jobs allocate resources and, and do things. And so that's kind of how stuff evolved. That is, that is amazing. Um, what would, um, looking back at the evolution of the field over the course of your career, what do you think should have received more attention in regards to your I'm going to reframe that question. Okay. What should have received a different form of attention? Okay. I got a lot of attention, extremely hostile. The war trap offended a substantial number of, of people in the field. Uh, and I was accused of all sorts of horrible things. The uh, you know, fundamental assumption of the war trap is that people who make decisions are rational, and therefore the choice to go to war is rational. And people found that offensive. They wanted war to be the product of terrible mistakes. Um, and I, you know, I, I, there were some very intelligent critiques of uh, the war trap, and there were some brutally nasty mm -hmm. critiques. Uh, one of the nasty critiques, I'm not going to mention the names of the people, they're still prominent, um, essentially said, well, whether this is true or not is besides the point. This is the sort of research nobody should do. It is evil to cast. Yeah, but it was a, yeah. Um, you know, I, I was... War Trap was published. I don't think I was. I, I, I don't think I had turned 35 yet. Mm -hmm. um, I, I never saw this coming. Mm -hmm. I thought. I thought when I was writing the book, I'm writing a good book. This is this is much better than anything I've ever done. In hindsight, it's a terrible book, but um, but it was a, a game changer. Uh, and, and I just never foresaw the kind of vitriolic response I would get. So, uh, and, and that has continued in different ways for a substantial part of my career. It's really only in the last decade or so that that, that has, has gone away. Um, it was very painful. Do you attribute the, the change in receptivity to how you package or kind of just other changes in um, regards to the field? I, I, I think uh, the change was that the, the work, despite the efforts of some people, um, caught on. Like people paid attention to it. And uh, I didn't disappear. I didn't go away. It wasn't a shot in the dark. Um, and eventually, people kind of shifted from I was some sort of monster to grudgingly accepting that this might be a way of thinking about things, not the best way, not the right way, but it's a way. It's a fad, then it wasn't a fad, and then people sort of shifted to, okay, we have to engage this, we have to argue with it, uh, and so on. So it was this, this gradual um, shift. But for about uh, 
15 years after the war crime, so from 1981 to mid 90s at least, and I just had a lot of very, very unpleasant experiences because of the work. And I wish that had been different. It, 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 it was very hard. You know, it, was, it was personally very hurtful. And, uh, Do you think that um, you were able to persist because you, in a sense, knew you were right? Were you stubborn? The combination? What do you think? Uh, I, I believe everybody who does research believes that they're right. I, I think if, if one does research and thinks it's not right, pretty depressing thing. So I think uh, that that's not a characteristic of any particular individual, that's of every individual. Um, stubborn, certainly. Jewish New York upbringing. You know, when I, when, when, when I, my first book was published, my dissertation, I brought a copy to my parents. My mother's first response was, it's so short. And it was this very much this, you know, surely you can do better. And I, uh, you know, I, I, I grew up with it. In a, in, a, in a pretty constructive, I had a very happy childhood, wonderful parents. It's kind of, keep, you know, you, you gotta keep aspiring. Um, and I, keep and at I, it, son. Keep at it, and I, I just kind of felt like, um, all right, I'm doing what I'm doing, and I think it's right, and they don't like it, and you know, I don't particularly like what they're doing, and fine. Uh, I think I'm moving things forward, and and, and there was a it's starting in '81, and it, was, it happened very quickly. Um, uh, before 1981, people had no in, in the field, sort of had basically no awareness of my, my existence. And I got papers published and so forth, but. Uh, after 80, 81 was sort of a, a, a separating moment for me. The, the war trap had a really big effect on people. And, and so it divided people into camps. And so I, I had people who thought I was evil and so forth. And then there were, there were people, a smaller group, um, who were sort of really excited by the prospect of thinking about things this way and doing stuff this way, and, and they could see it starting to grow, and that was sustaining. Uh, you know, I thought I was talking to somebody. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I, you wonder how, um, with the new kind of communication we have, how that feedback would actually multiply. Um, are there any approaches, theories, topics, etc., that you believe should have received less attention from the community? Yeah. Um, so let me and that's either of your own work or just generally speaking. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, let me preface my answer by what I think deserves attention. Work that is grounded in logic and evidence should get attention. That is work one can intelligently argue with. One can argue with it in terms of is there a logical error? Okay, the logic is sound. Is the evidence appropriate for evaluating the logic's implications and so on? In um, my own work, I would have liked more people to pay attention to the logic and the evidence. And so I said, there were some very good critiques of the work that was very bad. I didn't think it was a good critique at the time, but Harrison Wagner, for example, wrote a scaling critique of the work that And it was based on logic. He was right. I didn't see that at the time, mm -hmm. although his critique was one of the things that pushed me to learn game theory and to do more reason. Um, and I should have been more generous in crediting, crediting him with that at, at the time. Um, in the field in general, uh, I find very disheartening our reluctance to say that the theory has been falsified. I make a distinction that there are theoretical arguments that are just wrong, and there are theoretical arguments that are progressive. 
and I, I'm pretty sure all of my work is progressively wrong. And I think uh, neorealism is progressively wrong. And I cannot understand how people can cling to the neorealist perspective, or many of these system level perspectives, in light of careful logic and careful evidence that shows the flaws. I'll give you a, a simple example out of the theory of collisions. And I should add, Ken Waltz and I were on very good terms. He was very kind to me in my career. He went out of his way to try to advance my career. And I was very fond of him and very appreciative of that. And we both understood personal relations and intellectual views, but not the same thing. Um, in the theory of political, uh, uh, in the theory of uh, international politics, uh, at one point, uh, there's a footnote in which Ken Waltz says that uh, all international politics is a prisoner's dilemma. And that, almost pull up the page, but anyway. Uh, and then later in the book, he, he talks about uh, states in the core and on the periphery. And he says that in a bipolar world, the gains even on the periphery of one side are equal to the losses of the other. Okay, so he has claimed that international politics is a prisoner's war. And he has claimed that international politics, at least in a bipolar world, is a zero sum game. The prisoner's dilemma is not a zero sum game. So one of three things is possible. One is right, and the other is wrong. The other is right, and the former is wrong, or they're both wrong. They cannot both be wrong. Uh, I believe they're both wrong. I think uh, there are prisoners' dilemmas in international politics. There are zero-sum games in international politics, and there are lots of other things. Um, it's not one thing. Uh, I don't understand how somebody reading that work seriously can just slide over that. It cannot be true, and since it cannot be true, and you can draw one set of inferences from one claim and a different set of inferences from the other, you can say an awful lot of things that can't be uh, substantiated in logic. So, to me, you know, and it has uh, people make this personal. It has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with Ken. It has to do with an argument that needs to be internally consistent. And then we can ask the question, does the world look like this? Or we can ask the question, oh, gee, the world looks a certain way. We see certain patterns. We should step back and think about what logic might lead to that. I, I don't care which way people go, but we have to have logical consistency, and we have to have empirical evidence. And, and they can go in either sequence, but they need to be tied to each other. So I wish the field I don't comprehend how a field can persist in which this is so basic a claim. I don't understand how a field persists in believing in uh, research that can't withstand this simple test. And Ken himself, um, in the first few pages of the theory of political coalition, I'm sorry, the theory of international politics, uh, page 13, he lays out um, seven conditions for research. He says, you have to state your assumptions clearly and, and use the definitions consistently. And then he says, you have to have difficult and demanding tests. And the theory, that's perfectly reasonable. It's a perfectly reasonable, plausible theory. But it does not withstand the test of logic or of evidence. I, I don't understand why it, it, it persists. Do you think, um, I mean, Kuhn initially kind of comes to mind with regards to different ways that the profession kind of like moves forward, or do you think there's something about just, um, I mean, there is no journal of null findings, right? There is um, yeah. there is, there is a push of sorts to kind of, not necessarily maintain a belief that you can't sustain evidence for, but there's a particular way that we, we've crafted the enterprise that seems to kind of just buy certain elements of the scientific pro process where... Well, I think that's right, and uh, to not be ungenerous to our colleagues, let me note 
that probably the single most monumental piece of work ever done in science is Newton's printing. We talk about a game changer. He essentially invented science, as we go back to Galileo, to Copernicus, but essentially he put it together. Newtonian mechanics were not taught in Britain for a hundred years after the publication because it was contrary to the inherited set of beliefs, the mindset that people had about knowledge. It was offensive to them. It was taught on the continent. So, you know, physics we think of as this kind of pristine, rigorous field that were dismissive. Einstein's work, which of course supplants Newton's, much of the physics community at the time saw Einstein as doing metaphysics, not science. Hocus pocus. So, uh, fields are, you know, we're Bayesians. People are slow to accept change in, in their core beliefs. And that, that's, that's as it should be. Uh, in that sense, I don't take offense. At some point, the evidence should weigh in. Yeah, at some point, people do need to say, my God, they, this, this so, new order shook, 1989, new order arose, show uh, four theorems that follow from Waltz's theory, all four of which are empirically false. Nobody came forward and said that's not a proper representation of Waltz's theory. But everything that followed from it was empirically false. Doesn't say, oh, we're done. <laughs> yeah, moving right along. Um, if you had done an interview like this when you were in mid career, who would you have liked to interview? So you don't think I'm in mid career? Huh. Well, okay, I, I see the picture here. <laughs> <laughs> Earlier. Yeah. Earlier, there we go. Earlier. Um, so I would have loved to interview Bill Riker, but I interviewed Bill Riker every day, I believe, my colleague. Uh, I, I thought when, when, Bill, when Bill died, I, I, I have a chance to write poetry, unfortunately. And I wrote a poem about him, which I described him as once in a century. I had. He was a, he was a, a philosopher of uh, science at Chicago. He died a number of years ago in Howard Marcus. Uh, and Howard made a distinction that breakthroughs in science were not about discovering something fundamental, but about breaking a habit of mind, looking at what we already had in front of us, looking at it differently. And Bill did that. I would have loved a serious interview with Bill. Ten hours. Uh, Ken Arrow's impossibility theorem, to me, says something so fundamental about politics. And by the way, I was exposed to Arrow for the first time in Don Stokes' course, my first test for school, and for whatever reasons, hardly anybody in the course thought this was interesting. I mean, oh! And I looked at that and I said, later in the IR context. So what does Arrow's theorem tell us? Arrow's theorem tells us if there is such a thing as a national interest, we cannot know that we know what it is. And yet the field keeps talking about national interest. And it's so easy to construct an example in which two-thirds of the population want X, and without changing anybody's mind, two-thirds want not X and two-thirds want Y, and two-thirds want not Y. And so if a politician wants X and Y, the politician says, look, this is the national interest. Two-thirds of the people want it. And nobody sits back and says, yeah, but two-thirds want the opposite, too. Um, and when you think about Arrow, you realize, well, screw it. You just push that like you have those preferences and how you put it together. And that, again, to me said, foreign policy, international politics, which can all separate it, can't be separated, 
and we can't talk about national interests when we talk about leader interests. We have to talk about leader interests because they choose what to portray as a national interest. And after they portray it, one can look at it and say, oh my God, the super majority agree. So it must be right. And yet, super majority has it. Uh, so I would have loved, uh, I, I, I've gotten to know uh, Ken Arrow quite well over the years from my time uh, at, at Stanford. But I would have loved to have interviewed him about where these ideas came from. And he's very charming, that's the way. We and I were having a conversation one day, and he was talking about uh, Congress needing to pass this and the other bill to uh, improve social welfare. And I said, gee, you know, there's this theorem by this guy, Arrow, that uh, <laughs> there's no such thing as a knowable social welfare function. He said, oh, you're not stupid. Anyway, I would have loved to have interviewed those again. Okay, um, the last one. Thank you very much. Um, what do you think are the most exciting or promising areas in current research? Um, in the field? In my research? Um, I'll take one. Okay. Uh, <coughs> so, um, in the field, well, I was there, there are now I think a variety of, I think the, I think, uh, compelling models about how Domestic politics shape foreign affairs and shape conflict. There's the work by Jim Fearon, Audrey Cox, and so forth. Kenny Schultz uh, for a while on position. It's strange in the sense that you know, how stuff. So just reading it over. Fearon's work. Yeah, just reading it over. Fearon's uh, uh, audience costs paper, audience costs are exogenous. He did a great job on it. Alistair Smith and Dodge and I's them. Uh, but they were always on the same path. They brought us down to Slot Jail and Dodge and I's them where they could also be. Terrar, that's who they've been. There's an unpublished paper, it's been around for a number of years. Authors are unfortunately perfectionists. It should have been published years ago. Uh, by Scott Ashworth uh, and Chris Ramsey. That puts it all together, and so you have audience calls are endogenous, you have moral hazard problems, you have adverse selection problems, and we see how it works, and, and all the different contingencies, when it produces the fear on the results, when it produces the Smith results. Well, it's gorgeous. Uh, this is very exciting. Um, somebody needs to start taking this body of work um, and figure out and it's very nice to show how hard it is, why it's so hard to test. Uh, but we need to get empirical bite somehow, serious bite. It's very hard to do. It's really hard about it. Uh, to get a, a, a sense we've got, you know, got selected stuff, we've got sort of stuff, we've got position stuff, and others. Well, I think sniffing out something fundamental is the sense we're talking None of them quite remembered it, and to me it's just a very exciting to see this in all these different ways that we can start separating and work out where they are. Similar size with this right over. And, 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 and what, what bites me currently, what I see to go. And then we have all basically say this, they're all basically the same. That essentially is saying Carrick and, and I American is just area science. It's the same. So to me, this all says political science reduces to subjects, <laughs> positive theory, and more. And all these distinctions that we make with Americans. This is just there, 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 there's underlying. So um, that, that's one of the things I. <laughs> my own work. So, when my colleagues and I wrote The Logical Time of Survival, it was published in 2003. We started work for that. We started in uh, 
So, at that time, we were having a discussion. And one of our papers, or papers, or papers, had no idea the of the and the selected words So we started to think very early on about how to model the winning coalitions and we could see how to manage it. And it's very complicated and it's heavy assumptions. So we want to talk about work. And uh, Alistair Smith and I and the mathematician uh, have a paper currently under review in which we produce a theory of endogenous uh, And that theory includes and it's extremely, it's extremely general. And can you yes, um, and you can also be pushed down. And it's exactly the same to the same time. The paper is going to be used. So as we look at this, we realize that the theory we have constructed, which is this map that has been used in case this and this there's a 1946 paper uh, in scale, uh, in scale distribution what is the problem to the distribution of the uh, This model is a uh, model which uh, people are within the Poisson environment and certain actions uh, and separation of the various Poisson and all of this distribution. But anyway, what we discovered as we were writing this stuff on the doctor's group formation is we had an explanation for the rationality of motive in which we could in equilibrium any level of turnout. So with models that have rational voters, either at zero turnout or 100 percent, we can sustain any level of turnout in the And uh, so there was a you know, excited moment that we need nothing about voting after all. Although my dissertation was about voting, but um, you know, essentially nothing. That this it turns out two versions of law is a special case. It's a much more general law, which there are conditions that reduce the two versions of environment. Um, so I'm very excited about that. I think that has the potential to grow into really interesting stuff. Um, uh, Alistair and, and I and George Downs have. Taking another piece of uh, the logic of survival, we're happy with the, the tax part. And so we have uh, another paper on review. Um, we have now within the selected framework created a model of uh, income taxation. And um, it produces some not surprising results and some entirely novel results. And we test it. So it was more like a tax at what level? So it's how uh, high a tax or low a tax, how progressive or regressive, how it differs in terms of how it's imposed on the inland coalition compared to the uh, So it turns out. So there's a large literature on taxation, because you know, economists are worried about taxation for a long time. It turns out none of that literature, none of it, has a model of taxation that applies outside democracy. Our model applies to all forms of And in the democracy stuff, all of the prior results are 
variations on a common theme with different sets of assumptions that more the democratic countries have progressive tendencies. So we were able to show how progressivity varies within population systems and how big the countries are. And we were able to show as the population gets smaller, the taxes become less progressive. And when you get to really small pollution systems, you get free taxes. We were also able to show that in small coalition environments, you get much greater heterogeneity in the tax rate than you do in large coalition systems. And so you do little mind experiments, it's easy to see why this is not so. So if I'm in a small coalition environment, essentially I can, I can choose everybody in my own coalition given income slice, narrow slice. I might have um, Hugo Chavez coalition of um, a populist coalition. I might have a, uh, an elitist high income. And then we see we see from the side. So if I have a high income coalition, I'm going to want to choose the amount of money because so they want to tax rate because, you know, they, they, they got they to gotta pay it. They're going to get a lot of it back in planet goods, maybe more than they pay. They want a, they want a low tax rate. If you have a progressive coalition, they want to tax the people not in the coalition heavily. And so they want a high tax rate. And it turns out, so we we're able to show an equilibrium that Within the winning coalition, they want everybody in the coalition <laughs> to be treated equally in taxation in the utility sense. So you have to tax the richer people in the coalition because if so that the utility difference is equal. Because if, for example, um, the poor group is being taxed at a, uh, a higher rate than the equilibrium rate, they will prefer to join some other leader and will pay them a lot of So you have to for charging as many people. So you can't you get that by charging the other people. Because if you charge them too much more, they'll the back. Where, where do, are they all stable? So that's the result. Nobody had that before. Nobody had the heterogeneity. Maybe another result was kind of neat. Um, so, I know this is best that a resource course. And basically, the economics that a resource course says democracy is really fucking possible. I think uh, And if you're looking at data on the tax rates for Large coalition systems have more progressive taxes. Small coalition systems that can be used. natural resource growth to be had. More progressive than small coalition systems, but less progressive than comparably large coalition economic resources. The curve shifts and progressivity to be less progressive. Other source of so that's kind of fun. Uh, and, and, uh, in my head, I'm seeing the implications for repression as well. So oh yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, this is great. And we talk about that in lab. Absolutely, it's endogenous. You, know, you, you gotta keep the guys down. They're, having, they're being made to pay more than they're not in the coalition. They're, they're going to be asked to pay more. And,